Well, uh, once again, thank you very much for the intro uh, for the introduction and also for the invitation to this meeting. Well, today I'm going to speak on neutrino oscillation experiments. But well, I maybe I have to apologize. I was not sure what I should speak in this meeting in this school, and therefore this talk will be a rather um, a review of the neutrino oscillation experiments in the past, present, and also I'll briefly discuss future prospect. So, well, I hope it's okay. Okay, so uh, this is the outline of this talk. First, I'd like to discuss or review neutrino problems. Then I want to move on to neutrino oscillation studies. The first topic is new mu to new tau oscillations. The second topic is new e to new mu plus new tau oscillations. The third, then I want to discuss the third oscillation channel. And before finishing, I want to briefly discuss the agenda for future neutrino studies, and I will summarize this talk. Okay, uh, neutrino problems. <clears throat> First, I want to discuss solar neutrinos. Of course, the sun generates energy by nuclear fusion processes, and neutrinos are created by these processes. Therefore, the observation of solar neutrinos is very important to understand the energy generation mechanism in the sun. So, therefore, the first solar neutrino experiment was carried out more than 50 years ago. The first experiment was the Homestake home experiment. And this experiment indeed observed solar neutrinos for the first time. That was in the, in the late 60s. However, the observed wind rate was only about one third of the prediction. And therefore, people were puzzled. People discussed, uh, maybe the discrepancy between the theory and the experiment could be due to a problem in experiment, a problem in theory, or some people argued that we may not know the details of the properties of neutrinos. Anyway, um, since this was the only experiment that observed solar neutrinos at the end of the 1960s, therefore, after this experiment, uh, several experiments tried to observe solar neutrinos. And indeed, in the 20th century, several experiments observed solar neutrinos. Um, well, here I list four experiments. The first category is the gallium experiments. These experiments observed solar neutrinos, and in particular, um, a substantial fraction of the event rate should be due to PP solar neutrinos. Then another experiment is, as I already explained, the Homestake experiment. And the third one is the Kamiokande experiment. And the blue circles with error bars show the experimental data. 
the data points are shown relative to the standard solar model prediction. And you see all of these experiments showed a deficit of solar neutrinos. So by the end of the 20th century, we realized this solar neutrino problem cannot be a mistake in experiment. And therefore, uh, we have to be more careful about the solar neutrinos. Now, um, I want to discuss another problem. Well, we observe cosmic rays. Uh, cosmic rays are high energy particles coming to the Earth from somewhere in the un universe. Well, these cosmic rays are high energy particles. Many of them are protons. Some of them are helium nuclei or say iron nuclei. And these cosmic rays, once enter into the atmosphere, interact with the air nuclei and produce typically pions. Of course, pions are unstable, therefore decay to other particles. Well, other particles means neutrinos and muons. And muons are also unstable, therefore decay to an electron and two neutrinos. So, during this decay chain, neutrinos are created. And in fact, in 1965, atmospheric neutrinos were observed for the first time by detectors located extremely deep underground. One was in India and one was in South Africa. Now, in the 1970s, newly proposed grand unified theories predicted that protons should decay with a lifetime of about 10 to 30 years. Well, I would say this was a great prediction, great theory, great prediction. And if we observe proton decays, that tells us the idea of grand unified theories is right. And therefore, several proton decay experiments began in the early 1980s. One was KGF in India, IMB in United States, NUSEX in Europe, Kamiokande in Japan, produced in Europe. Now, these proton decay experiments in the 80s observed many atmospheric neutrino events. And because atmospheric neutrinos were the most serious background to the proton decay searches, it was necessary to understand atmospheric neutrino interactions. We'd like to separate atmospheric neutrino interactions and proton decays. During these studies, people observed a significant deficit of atmospheric muon neutrino events. Here, I show the data from Kamiokande and IMB experiments. Here, the horizontal axis shows the mu over E ratio of the data and divided by the same ratio of the Monte Carlo prediction. So both Kamiokande and IMB experiments observed a significant deficit of mu neutrinos. Now, well, these are the neutrino problems and both of these problems, people observed deficit of neutrinos. 
Well, there have been a lot of discussions on these problems, uh, but from the early days, people thought that maybe these data suggest new gene oscillations. So before discussing more recent data, I want to briefly discuss new gene oscillations. Of course, in the standard model of particle physics, neutrinos are assumed to be massless. However, physicists have been asking, neutrinos really have no mass. And also, it was generally believed if neutrinos have very small mass, the small neutrino mass may imply physics beyond the standard model um, well, this is called the system mechanism. Um, in order to generate very small mass, you typically need a very heavy neutrino-like um, neutral particle. So this is system mechanism. And if neutrinos have very small mass, they change their flavor while propagating in the vacuum or in the matter namely neutrino oscillations. And here I show the new mu to, or new A to new B oscillation probability, assuming two flavor vacuum oscillations. So clearly neutrino oscill oscillations are very important. <clears throat> okay. Now, I'd like to move on to the discussion of neutrino oscillations, neutrino oscillation experiments. The first experiment I want to discuss is the Super Kamiokande experiment. It is a very large water Cherenkov detector. It has about 40 meters in diameter and 40 meters in height and it contains 50,000 tons of extremely clean water. It is located deep underground, about 100 meters from the top of the mountain. And Super Kamiokande is an international collaboration. We have about 230 collaborators from these countries. Now, I discussed there was atmospheric neutrino problem, but from the beginning, people thought maybe the problem is due to neutrino oscillations. But we wanted to have a very strong evidence, neutrino oscillations. So, in Super Kamiokande, we thought this way. As I mentioned, these neutrinos are created by cosmic ray interactions in the atmosphere. Therefore, some of these neutrinos are created above the detector, typically 10 to 20, kilo 10 to 20 kilometers above the detector. And these neutrinos come to the detector after traveling 10 to 20 kilometers. Maybe 10 to 20 kilometers could be too short for neutrinos to oscillate. On the other hand, of course, atmospheric neutrinos are created also in the other side of the Earth. And these neutrinos also come to the Super Kamiokande detector. But before coming to the Super Kamiokande detector, they have to travel very long distances. Typically, they have to travel 10,000 kilometers. Therefore, 
these neutrinos may oscillate. So if we think this way, um, we expect that um, downgoing neutrinos may have no time to oscillate, but upward going neutrinos may have enough time to oscillate. And if the oscillation is new mu to new tau, we should be able to observe a deficit of upward going neutrinos. Therefore, up, up, up versus down asymmetry of the atmospheric mu or neutrinos should be observed. And in fact, um, by simply counting the event rate, it was clear that we need a very large detector. And that was Super Kamiokande. Well, <clears throat> Super Kamiokande experiment started in April 1996. And in about two years, Super Kamiokande was able to give the first significant result. And the result was presented at the Neutrino Conference in 1998. And here I show one of the slides they presented at that meeting. Here, the upper panel is for new E, and the bottom one is for new mu. And the horizontal axis is the Zin's angle. Cosine theta one means downgoing neutrinos, minus one means upward going neutrinos. And black circles show the data, and Hatched histogram shows the Monte Carlo prediction. And in the Monte Carlo prediction, neutrino oscillations are not included. Then, by looking at the uh, bottom one, you find for downgoing neutrinos, the data and Monte Carlo prediction agreed quite well. But for the upward going neutrinos, the data showed a significant deficit. And indeed, up versus down asymmetry was more than six sigma. So there was a very strong evidence for neutrino oscillations. In fact, um, Super Kamiokande had other evidence, and therefore they tried new mu to new tau to flavor oscillation fit. And the result of the oscillation fit was shown here. And from these um, contours, uh, Super Kamiokande concluded that the observed things and dependent deficit and the other supporting data gave evidence for neutrino oscillations. <clears throat> well, of course, um, all the neutrino community was excited. And from that time on, there have been many um, neutrino oscillation studies. Here, I show various uh, atmospheric neutrinos and long baseline accelerator neutrino oscillation experiments. So since 1998, these experiments have been improving our knowledge on new mu to new tau oscillations. In fact, I want to discuss briefly how people improved um, in accelerator-based long baseline experiments. Here, I show new disappearance study results. The first experiment was K K2K, and they observed deficit of new mu events. In addition, they had evidence for new mu energy spectrum distortion. The black curve was no oscillation energy spectrum, and the red one was the uh, spectrum assuming neutrino oscillations, and data favored neutrino oscillations. 
The next experiment was the minus experiment. And compared with K to K, you find a significant increase in statistics. And indeed, by these high statistics, minus much, much precisely determined new gene association parameters. The third generation experiment, they are the present experiments, T2K and NOVA. And these experiments, in fact, tune the neutrino energy, tune the neutrino energy so that um, they can observe the maximum oscillation effect. For example, please look at the T2K case. Well, blue histogram shows no oscillation prediction. However, beam energy was tuned to, to expect the very significant oscillation effect. Therefore, the observed event rate was much fewer, much lower, as compared with the no oscillation case. And the energy spectrum was also cons completely consistent with large mixing and new mu oscillations. The NOVA data are quite similar. And in both experiments, um, neutrino oscillation parameters, sine squared theta 2, 3, and delta m 2, 3 square were precisely determined. Well, so far, I discussed disappearance of new neutrinos, and people concluded the data are completely consistent new mu to new tau oscillations. However, if the oscillation is new mu to new tau, one should be able to observe the tau neutrino appearance. Actually, this was not, a, not, this was not easy. We needed a dedicated um, new tau experiment, OPERA, and indeed, um, OPERA observed very significant evidence for new tau appearance. Here I show one of the uh, new tau candidate events. In addition, Super and Ice Cube had a statistical analysis and found the data favors new tau appearance. So from this data, we happily conclude, indeed, the oscillation, main oscillation channel was in new mu to new tau. Now I'd like to move on to the second oscillation, that is new e to new mu to new tau. Well, at the beginning, I, I introduced the solar neutrino problem. Well, as I mentioned, um, people discussed why the Homestake experiment observes, observes the deficit of solar neutrinos, and people thought maybe the deficit of solar neutrinos was due to neutrino oscillations. However, at that time, people had, had other possibilities, such as some problem in solar modeling. Therefore, people thought we need some conclus conclusive evidence for solar neutrino oscillations. Then in 1985, a great idea appeared. Hub Chen told us that there is a direct approach to resolve the solar neutrino problem. The way would be to observe neutrinos by use of both neutral current and charge current reactions. Then the total neutrino flux and the electron neutrino flux 
will be separately determined to provide independent tests of the new gene association hypothesis on the standard soil model. A large heavy water Cherenkov detector sensitive to neutrinos from boron A decay via the neutral current reaction, nu plus D going to neutrino plus proton plus neutron on the charged current reaction, nu E plus D going to electron plus proton plus plus, uh, proton plus proton is suggested for this purpose. Okay, this was a great idea. And therefore, um, the snow experiment was constructed. Um, snow experiment used 1,000 tons of heavy water. Therefore, this experiment should be able to directly test what Hub Chen proposed. Indeed, um, the snow experiment was very successful, and they measured the sol boron-H solar neutrinos by neutral current reaction and charged current reaction. Here, in this, in this plot, the new constraint on the new E flux is in the horizontal axis, on the vertical axis is a constraint on new mu plus new tau flux. Then the blue band shows the constraint on neutral uh, constraints um, obtained by neutral current interactions. And the red band is a constraint obtained by the charged current interactions. Of course, charged current interaction is only sensitive to new E. So you, you can naively expect this vertical axis, a uh, vertical band. In addition, uh, Snow observed neutrino electron elastic scattering. Uh, neutrino electron elastic scattering has the uh, largest cross section if neutrino flavor is new E, but because of the uh, elastic scattering, new mu and new tau also interact, but with the reduced cross section. And therefore, the constraint by elastic scattering is shown by green. And of course, Super Kamio Kande has been observing solar neutrinos by elastic scattering. And therefore, the Super Kamio Kande constraint is shown by gray or dark blue, uh, dark green. Anyway, from this figure, we immediately find three or four different measurements intersect at a point, and the intersect point clearly indicates non-zero new mu plus new tau flux. So this was a very clear evidence for new E to new mu plus new tau oscillations. I, I just want to mention another experiment that was the Kamrand experiment. Kamrand is a one kiloton liquid scintillator detector constructed at the location of Kamiokande experiment. Um, in the early, uh, early in the early this century, there were many nuclear power stations around Kamrand at a typical distance of about 180 kilometers. And common people realized they can measure these anti-electron neutrinos, and therefore, um, this is a long baseline reactor neutrino oscillation experiment. And the data from Kamran is shown here. This is an energy spectrum of neutrinos from nuclear power stations observed in Kamran. 
here the dotted histogram shows the prediction without oscillations. And clearly, energy spectrum of the data are different. But if they assume neutrino oscillations, it's possible to reproduce the data very well. In addition, they show the data this way. Here, the horizontal axis is L over E. And if the deficit is due to neutrino oscillations, um, the data should show an oscillatory pattern if the horizontal axis is L over E. And indeed, the data clearly showed oscillatory pattern. And therefore, essentially, all the people were convinced that solar neutrino deficit was indeed neutrino, due to neutrino oscillations. So we are very happy. We were convinced that solar neutrino, oscillation, solar neutrino deficit was really neutrino oscillations. Now, I want to discuss a recent progress. In recent days, um, we, have, we have evidence for MSW, that is the matter effect. So due to the matter effect in the Earth, we expect that the nighttime solar new flux is slightly higher than the daytime flux. Well, the expected solar new e survival probability is shown in the right. So we expect the regeneration of solar new e in high, high in relatively high energy region, assuming the presently presently known uh, neutrino oscillation parameters. And indeed, I. I'm very happy to show you the most recent SuperK data. SuperK has been observing solar neutrinos. And so far, there have been four phases of Super Kamiokande data acquisition. And in here, I show the day-night asymmetry of the solar neutrino flux. And in all phases, uh, they observed a slight asymmetry. And if they combine all the super K data, they found about minus 2.9% on difference. Well, that means in the night time, there's slight, slightly more solar neutrino flux. And this is a three sigma evidence for day-night effect. And essentially, the, this, this um, day-night asymmetry is consistent with the, um, with the expectation based on the, on the known delta m square and sine square two theta. And finally, I want to mention the Brexino experiment. Proxino is designed to measure sub MEB solar neutrinos. And indeed, this experiment was very successful. In the right, um, I show the solar new E survival probability for PP, Barium 7, PEP, and Boron 8 solar neutrinos. And the uh, pink curve shows the MSW prediction. And indeed, the data are just consistent with the MSW prediction. And finally, I want to mention that Boroxino successfully observed CNO solar neutrinos for the first time. And to me, this was really a great achievement. So I think we indeed understood uh, solar, solar neutrino oscillations quite well. 
Now I'd like to move on to the third oscillation channel. Since there are three neutrino flavors, and therefore there should be three mixing angles, and therefore we should be able to observe third oscillation channel. Mm. Indeed, there have been various experiments that try to observe the third oscillation channel. The one category of, uh, of uh, experiments are the long baseline experiments. Another category was the reactor short baseline neutrino oscillation experiments. And in these, these experiments observed evidence for the third oscillation, third neutrino oscillations. Um, Minos and Tizuke, in particular Tizuke, observed evidence for new E appearance in the new mu beam. And the reactor, is, reactor neutrino oscillation experiments, Daya Bay, Dino, and W. Show observed deficit of reactor anti neutrinos at the short baseline of one to two kilometers. Oh, by the way, today I only show a very early data. Data in taken published in 2011 to 2012. The updated data are much better, much cleaner. And of course, nowadays, NOVA shows a very clean data. In any case, from these measurements, the basic structure for three flavor neutrino oscillations have been, has been understood. Well, of course, these data are more than 10 years old. Therefore, there have been many up updates. And I'd like to show you that we, there have been a lot of experiments still going on. This is the list of the experiments that contributed to our understanding of neutrino oscillations. Now, before finishing the well, present status, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> I would like to summarize the neutrino oscillation parameters. Well, as I said, there, there are three mixing angles. In addition, there should be two delta M squares, delta M21 square and delta M31 square. In addition, um, there should be a CP phase. So uh, this is the global fit, assuming normal mass ordering or inverted mass ordering. The normal mass ordering is uh, shown here uh, in, the, in the right. Nu3 is assumed to be the heaviest, but in the inverted mass ordering, Nu3 is assumed to be the lightest. Now the present data, slightly favors normal mass ordering, but well, at this moment, uh, to be honest, we cannot really conclude that the true mass ordering is normal. Anyway, please look at these fit result carefully you find now, now we rather precisely determine neutrino oscillation parameters, mixing angles and delta m square parameters are determined to an accuracy of 1% to 3%. So already um, we have entered into a very precise measurement phase 
Of course, in addition, I want to mention that neutrino mass is very small. Well, in order to really prove that neutrino mass is very small, we need other experiments. But let me say, probably more than 10 orders of magnitude smaller than the corresponding mass of quarks and charged leptons. So neutrino mass is very small. In addition, neutrino mixing angles are large compared with the corresponding quark mixing angles. Well, to me, uh, this is what we learned from these neutrino oscillation experiments. Finally, it is clear that at this moment, we are not able to conclude about the CP violation phase. OK, now I want to discuss the agenda for future neutrino studies. Well, clearly, at this moment, we clearly understand uh, neutrino oscillations, but we do not understand everything. Uh, for example, as I mentioned, uh, we are not sure about the neutrino mass ordering. At present, normal mass ordering is slightly favored over the inverted mass ordering, but uh, we cannot be conclusive. Um, well, in addition, we are not sure about the neutrino mass because neutrino oscillation experiments are only sensitive to neutrino mass square difference. And fine, oh, well, in addition, um, we are not sure if there is any structure beyond the minimum three flavor framework. Namely, we are not sure if stellar neutrinos exist. Also, we are not sure if CP is violated in neutrino oscillations or neutrinos. In fact, I think CP violation in neutrino oscillation is very important. And, oh, well, sorry, CP violation in neutrino physics seems to be very important. They could be related to the baryon asymmetry of the universe. And finally, uh, we do not know if neutrinos are Majorana particles. So in the remaining five, 10 minutes, I want to discuss CP vibration. Now, let's see uh, what is the present data. Here, I show the most updated data from NOVA and T2K. Um, in both NOVA and T2K, they show that new E event in the horizontal axis and new E bar events in the vertical axis. And depending on CP phase, um, the expected data point should be somewhere, oh, sorry, uh, somewhere on this um, ellipse. But in addition, depending on the mass ordering, the uh, this ellipse could be location of the, could, of the this circle should be different. Um, in addition, of course, uh, depending on the precise um, sine square, no, no, precise theta two three value, um, the points should be different. In any case, well, the NOVA data as shown in the left by the black circle and the T2K data as shown by uh, a white circle in the right. And you immediately find the suggested parameter region could be different between NOVA and T2K. So clearly the present experiments, NOVA and T2K shows 
that they could indeed um, tell us the value of CP value, uh, CP phase, but the present data statistics are not in high enough. Therefore, we think we need the next generation experiments. So, we definitely would like to observe if neutrino oscillations of neutrinos and those of anti neutrinos are different. But as the present data suggests, we need the next generation long baseline experiments. One is Dune in the United States, another is Hyper K located in Japan. In fact, both Dune and Hyper K has have very high sensitivity um, to CP phase. So in some most um, optimistic, optimistic cases, uh, they should be able to observe about seven to eight sigma effect. So it's very nice that both experiments have very good sensitivities and therefore we are looking forward to seeing the results from these experiments. Now, before finishing, I'd like to briefly mention about the status of Hyper-K. Um, uh, first of all, I'd like to remind you that the water Cherenkov detectors had, had kind of good history. Kamiokande and IMP experiment observed neutrinos from supernova 1987A. They observed atomic neutrino deficit. Kamiokande observed solar neutrinos, solar neutrino deficit. Super Kamiokande discovered atmospheric neutrino oscillations and contributed to solar neutrino oscillations with the snow. And Super K has been used for far detector for T2K and uh, for K2K and T2K. So we naturally expect a good result from Hyper K. And I, before finishing, I'd like to briefly mention about the status of Hyper K. The construction started in 2020. At this moment, um, um, we are still in the excavation phase. Um, this photo was, was taken in March this year, and we expect the excavation will be finished in a year. And the experiment will start in 2027. And by the way, uh, this Hyper K is a very large water Cherenkov detector. Therefore, we expect many important research topics in neutrino physics and astrophysics with this very large fiducial mass of 190 kilotons. Uh, by the way, Hyper Kamiokande is a very large international collaboration. We have about 600 members from 22 countries. Okay, well, that's all. Let me summarize. As I discussed today, neutrinos have been playing very important roles in understanding laws of nature, in particular laws at the smallest scales. And recent discovery and studies of neutrino oscillations and the small neutrino mass must be very important to understand the physics beyond the standard model particle physics. And neutrinos is small mass might also be the key to understand the big question in the, in the large scale, namely the universe, why only matter particles exist at the present day universe. So I think neutrinos are likely to continue playing very important roles in understanding the nature in the smallest and the largest scales. Okay, that's all from me. Thank you very much. Thank you.
thank you kajita sir and i must inform the audience that uh, kajita sir is also associated with kagra project a project looking for the gravitational waves thank you is pi of that project questions yes hello kajita san this is rubaboti uh, can you hear me yes ah how are you good so um, nice to see you i wanted to ask yeah. you one question as you showed there are some discrepancies between t2k and nova result mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. now we have seen joint t2k and nova analysis yeah right so do you think like you know that's how we should proceed like doing this kind of joint analysis and uh, what is your take on this thank you thank you indeed well of course joint analysis is very important but well as far as i heard um well both t2k and nova prefers normal mass ordering but but if they combine the data, both of these data, the prefer there's a slight preference for the inverted mass ordering. Well, okay, maybe this is true, but well, certainly um, I would like to see first of all that T2K and Nova shows consistent result. Well, as far as I understand, uh, the combined analysis results prefers inverted mass ordering is due to the suggested CP parameter phase. In case of normal mass ordering, the suggested CP phase is different, but in case of the inverted mass ordering, suggested CP phase is in the same region. I, I understand this is the reason for this um, a bit strange result. So once again, I really hope, first of all, T2K and NOVA give us the consistent result. Then we'd like to see the combined analysis result. Thank you. Uh, Kajita Sen, I'm Govinda from TIFR. I just add one more point on this merging. In collider mm -hmm. experiment everywhere, instead of one experiment, we had the two or three experiments just first to establish the topic independently. Mm. Once you establish the independent, then to have the have the greater precision measurement, you combine the result. But at the when there is a controversy, that should not be merging. It should be independent yeah. analysis. Yeah. I fully, fully, fully agree. Thank you. Any other question? No. Let's thank uh, Professor Kajita San again for the fabulous talk. Thank you very much, Kajita. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>